Hello, my name is uh, Pat Allen, and we are here today uh, to do the interview of Chester Richard Robinson, a Viet Vietnam veteran. And we are taking this interview, making this interview for the Library of Congress, and it's done under the auspices of the Cincinnati Hamilton County Public Library and the uh, person that is heading that program up for the library is uh, Brian Powers and we are here at the uh, Cincinnati State Community College uh, Middletown Branch Campus and our cameraman today is uh, Dave Gillen. Uh, first of all let me uh, thank you for doing this interview and thank you for your service uh, to our country and I understand from our conversations earlier you go by Dick yes rather than Chester I've always been a dick uh, <laughs> even during my services uh, in, in Vietnam they gave me other nicknames well we, we uh, may not want to go into those it, it, it's it's funny <clears throat> I better not say it here. It's uh, I, I, I like country music. I was the only 18-year-old kid went in over there liking country music from Ohio. <laughs> and needless to say, when when we had a uh, opportunity to get to a radio, and uh, well, this goes back a long way. We listened at Armed Forces Radio Station, and and we could get a country station. Uh, but the guys gave me a nickname as Shit Kicker. <laughs> there, there's that. <laughs> we gotta tell it like it is. All right. Uh, that first bef bleep. <laughs> bef before we get it, no, there isn't anything bleeped in these interviews. Uh, uh, these things are going to be recorded for posterity, and uh, we want you to tell your story. But before we get into your military uh, career and your work career, uh, tell us where you were born and when you were born. I was born in uh, Perry County, Kentucky in, in 1949. A little, it was a little coal mining camp called Leatherwood. Uh, we moved out of there and I was roughly a year old b before my family come up here to Ohio. And when your family came to Ohio, where did you come? Middletown. Middletown. Uh, it's basically in, in the same area where, where I grew up, uh, the little section the little section down down there called Ingalls Corner it's not as it wasn't as big as that was now there was a, a, a truck stop on one corner uh, a little IGA store on the other corner and I had several uh, members of the family used to work there at one point in time and I was told at one time dad was a, a butcher in there to in the meat market in that part before he got uh, uh, hard on at Armco Steel. When the family lived down in Kentucky, was your dad working in the coal mines? Dad did, uh, and, and I think that's why he migrated to Ohio because the, he said the work was very hard uh, now. Whether he worked in the mine or somewhere on the outside of it, uh, uh, I, I'm not sure. Like, like I said, that's just something we never talked about, but some of my uh, uncles would tell me bits and pieces about how things were because they worked side by side. Uh, Do you remember if those were shaft mines or were they drift mines back into the mountain? Uh, they they were underground mines. Now that's that's a shaft mine, I understand, but they they didn't they didn't have too much strip mining back then. Okay. Uh, what was your dad's name? Chester. And um, is he still with us? No. That now dad dad died in '94. Right. New Year's. New Year's Eve of 94. And wh wh do you remember where he was born? No, I don't. It's uh, Down the, in Kentucky? Down in Kentucky. Uh, uh, something uh, Big Sandy, and I don't know if that's a, a, a creek, a river, or just a community. Uh, that rings a bell with me a little bit. Now, right. all, all, all my relatives, uh, except for some cousins, have, uh, Dad's side and my mother's side are, are no longer with us. Uh, I lost I lost my last uncle. I think it was just a year ago, and he was a World War II vet. He uh, what, was 90, what? 96 years old, I believe it was. What branch was he in? He was in the army. And where, do you remember where he served? 
Well, that, actually, uh, Uncle Mervyn, uh, my Uncle James, and, and Dad, all three of them were in Europe. And there, there was a little story in the paper that one of my cousins have. I, I haven't seen it in a long time, but they actually met. Uh, they had, they were having a little break. Uh, it, it was, uh, like I said, somewhere in Europe, and, and it was a like an old home reunion for those three. Uh, but they all made it home. Well, good. Were they all in the army? They were all in the army. Uh, do you have any recollection of what uh, rank your father reached? Uh, no. I, I know that uh, as a kid growing up, I, I found his uh, uh, uniform jacket hanging in a closet, and I thought, I wonder what this is. I started playing with his buttons and stuff like that, and uh, when he found out I had almost destroyed it, he, he got kind of upset with it, but I was a a uh, three, four-year-old kid that didn't know what, what was going on. Uh, did he ever talk to you about what he did? Was he an infantryman or? Uh, uh, I believe Dad was a truck driver at times, but the other times he, he was uh, infantry. Uh, in supply or what, I don't know, because uh, there, it, I know he was close to the Battle of the Bulge. You know, whether that was before or after, I'm not sure. That, that is a story that comes to me, but but the other places I know they started in France and went east. Okay. Well, how about your mom? What's your mom's name? My mom was named uh, Mom. Uh, uh, everybody called her Violet. She didn't go by Mary. Uh, the, the the last recollection I have of Mom was. Uh, this time of the year, during Easter, uh, we went up to the old Middletown Hospital, and uh, she was up about the second floor, or so and we was out on the in the green grass waving at her because we weren't kids weren't allowed up in the hospital at that time, and uh, she had just uh, gave birth to my youngest sister, and I think two weeks later she was back in the hospital with pneumonia. And that's she died there. Oh wow! And like I said, I was about five years old. But before all that happened, I was in kindergarten at, at the old Amanda Elementary School, and I remember Mom uh, walking me down to the bus stop and put me on the bus, and then she'd be there. Uh, come, come time to get off, come to get me. Uh, now her maiden, her name was Mary Violet, and maiden name was Hamilton. Hamilton. All right, and have any recollection of when your mom and dad got married? It was, no, they, they could have, well, they had to have been married before then because uh, my, my older sister, you know, she's six years older than me, so somewhere in that time frame between uh, <laughs> World War II and, and that, uh, uh, I know that uh, my, my sister, when I go back when I was a kid, she, she wanted to be the boss. <laughs> and, and I had to let her. <laughs> well, when, you're, when your parents and the family came up here to Middletown, uh, what kind of work did your dad do? Well, Dad, uh, I like to say he was a jack of all trades, but he, he did have knowledge of uh, meat. Uh, and I don't know if he ever done anything like that down in Kentucky before they come up here, but he, he had a he had a job at the little IGA. Uh, As a butcher? Well, they, he got a job at the butcher. I had a, a couple of cousins that worked in there. Uh, they, they were older cousins. Uh, uh, whether, whether or not that was instrumental, I believe at one time there were apartments across the, uh, the top of the store. We may have lived there for a, a time or two. I know in, in the uh, community behind there, there was big open fields. Like I said, it, it, it wasn't as packed like it is now. There was open spaces, but there was about a little five house community back there and we lived in one of those houses for a while. Uh, I don't know, a couple of years maybe, then we got into the house where I basically grew up in. 
No, well, no, I take that back. Uh, one of my aunts told me that we lived down on Fifth Avenue when, when I was probably learning how to walk. That was probably before we moved to where, we, where I grew up. Because she said they had sidewalks and where we moved to, it was just open. Uh, it was an older community, o Oneida. Uh, lately it became, uh, you know, when I was in the service, they called it all, all kinds of names because all the streets were named uh, after Indians, Indian tribes. And uh, when I went into the service, I was 18. Uh, we lived there, and, uh, well, I can't remember when we first moved there, but I remember when we moved in, there was a, a an old, uh, it, it was an old wooden farm wagon sitting in our side yard. And I, I thought, well, you know, we're we're going out to a, a cattle ranch or something like that, because that's what what we saw on the old uh, westerns and things. But it belonged to a a neighbor's grandfather that lived on another street. And uh, shortly after we moved in there, the, the the wagon disappeared. I don't know when it left or where it went, but it had the the wooden wheels and all that. And uh, f from there on, it was. Uh, you know, it's it's hard to go back that far. Right. Uh, it, it, I just remember uh, little bits and pieces. Uh, now what grade school did you go to? I went to Oneida. Oneida? I, I started out, like I said, at uh, kindergarten at Amanda Elementary. And uh, at, at, at the time I was going to kindergarten, Oneida was being built right. on, on uh, Yankee Road there. And I had some... Uh, relatives that, that were in construction work and they they uh, helped build that school. Where'd you go to high school? I went to Monroe, uh, Lemon Monroe. Uh, I don't know why they, well, it was a township school to start out. That's that's uh, why they called it Lemon Monroe. They were, it stayed that way to somewhere, I don't know, probably by the time we were in uh, junior high school. And then Monroe and Middletown merged. Uh, they became one uh, school district. They, uh, I don't know, we, we were kind of ingrained there that, that we were all uh, Monroe fans. Mid Middletown just a, a little bit away from us and, and they were middies. We, we would rather have been uh, Hornets than to be a middie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. When did you graduate uh, and then go into the service? Well, I graduated in uh, 1967. Uh, probably four years before that was, was uh, when I met my wife, but she didn't know it at that time. Uh, when, when Dad remarried, uh, I was, oh, right about 12, 13 years old when Dad remarried, married my stepmother. And uh, it, it brings back a, a, a couple of sad memories because I believe they had my mother's uh, funeral in that church that uh, Dad remarried in. And But that's where I met my wife. Well, she was uh, a year younger than me, but uh, her parents went to church there, and, and uh, as I later found out, we were going to be going to school together. But that down at the uh, uh, the, the new Amanda uh, junior high school, well, she grew up over in Mayfield, Mayfield uh, in Middletown, and uh, it was just one of those things where she liked knowing somebody that that. She had uh, communication with at least once a week, and then going to church and Sunday school. Well, that that happened that way. But going to school, she said, "Well, I know somebody older than me down here." <laughs> and it it uh, we had our differences of opinion at times, but we we uh, we talked long and hard about uh, our life after school and stuff like that. And one day, I got up the nerve to ask her if she would marry me. 
Now, was this well, after you'd been in the service? No, I was I was still a teenager. <laughs> I was I was I was thinking way ahead. Uh, it may have been a uh, a uh, I need a little help there. Uh, a, a fad. We didn't have a lot of a lot of fads back then until later on. That uh, after I started having you know, a family, that, that's when the, all the fads came out, but for her and I, it, it could have been a fad, but I had a, a, a little part-time job working for one of the uh, uh, Middletown, I call him an, an aristocrat, it, uh, he had a business downtown uh, uh, working, uh, he had a, an antique shop and a, and a drapery shop, uh, and it, they were two different entities there, but I would uh, work on the weekends and uh, some after schools, uh, just doing little odd jobs, cutting grass, raking leaves, and uh, you know helping with deliveries. Uh, I made about seventy-five cents an hour, so I was able to, I thought, afford, afford an engagement ring. And uh, I, I went to Rogers Jewelry down on Central Avenue and, and stuck my nose in the window, and I said, I like that one. That, well, it was uh, one Saturday, uh, her, her mother always went down to the Murphy's Five and Dime for knickknacks and stuff like that, and she went with her, and I said, take a walk with me down the street here. We, we stopped in front of there, I said, what do you think about this ring? Well, she said, I like that. And I said, well, it's yours. <laughs> 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 uh, How old were you then? Uh, probably 15, somewhere in that range. I, uh, my mind doesn't go back that far too too many times, but uh, it 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 goes back there now. I was about 15 years old, and, and like I said, I had a job, uh, and I'm, I I could pay on that ring. I think 50 cents a week. <laughs> what well, did the the whole thing probably only cost. Five hundred dollars if if, uh, if if we if we're getting into money, but uh, that was a lot of money in those days. Sure was, sure was. How uh, about uh, when when you graduated? How long uh, were you a civilian before you enlisted? Well, I, when I graduated, I had a I had another part time job. I worked for my step uncle, was my my stepmother's brother. He had his own business laying hardwood floors. And on the weekends, and uh, sometimes when uh, after school hours and stuff like that, if he had a job close enough, I could help him in that time span. So I, I was, I thought I was in a, a, a grown up world on the weekends because I was uh, doing a man's work and I, I could make $100 a weekend. So that, that helped me out. And after uh, after graduation, well, I, I was working full time with him for about two months, and uh, I started uh, going through Middletown looking for other jobs, other sources, uh, and I run into five friends. We were downtown, down down in this area of, of town, and and they said, uh, where, "Where are you going?" I said, "I'm going up here to a little place called Crystal Tissue." I said, never heard of it. I said, well, it, it's kind of out of the way. It's a paper mill. All the paper mills were located down here. And I thought, well, maybe maybe I'll get lucky up there. But we used to have a, uh, I can't call it an unemployment office, but it was a place where you could come and find, look for jobs. Uh, but we all kind of met up there in their, their uh, Human Resource Office, uh, and I'll put in applications together, and uh, we all got hard within a day of each other. And, and that was my first, well, first opportunity to, to work a second shift, and I hated it. Uh, what, what did you do? What was your task? It was it was a, a, a jack of all trade type thing. Go sweep here, go clean there. Uh, you'd, you'd get on a machine, you learn. What what would what to do there? Get on another machine, learn what to do there, and hope you remembered 
what happened over here the next time you got on it because it was a, a never ending it, it was movement so uh, when you got when you got on with crystal tissue uh, did you uh, give up your uh, weekend jobs with your step uncle uh, no <laughs> kept doing that I I, I liked it uh, I, there, there was something about the hardwood flooring uh, I guess I must have went in love with the with the wood uh, the work was hard don't let me uh, get away from that too much it, it was hard it, it was it wasn't demanding I just liked it you know sitting there it's like putting a puzzle together when you lay your flooring out uh, you try to match up what looks pretty uh, you it's look look pretty to me but when the when the lady that's going to be doing those floors after they uh, get their house you wanted to look pretty for them uh, and that's that's what I was trying to do is, is uh, ma match it all up and uh, my uh, step uncle uh, I'm probably getting a little ahead of myself but he was uh, a veteran of Korean conflict Korean okay. War what branch was he in? he was uh, he was in the army but, but he was he was an engineer and he is actually the only one that I could relate to ab about combat and uh, what was his name? Marvin. Marvin Halsey. Marvin Halsey. Yeah. H A L S E Y. Yes. Uh, do you know what unit or? What no. All I know is uh, uh, he he was in the uh, uh, National Guard for a, a long time after he he got back out of the uh, Korean War. And like I said, I I didn't know him from you or I or this fellow over here for, from uh, un until uh, dad and my stepmother got married. Well you said the only thing you knew about combat was from him. Well, uh, had you he, talked to him about that before? He, he would he would talk to me like you know why why do I want to go in you know because I volunteered for the draft and he, he would uh, uh, like I said dad never told me about his uh, military experience. I never asked. Uh, I don't know why, but but Marvin would kind of take me to the side that I, I guess he had experiences that during the Korean War and I'm finding out things uh, at, after you and I had talked a couple of weeks ago that uh, the Korea wasn't all it was cracked up to be. It was a pretty bad operation. Right. Uh, you know, when, I, when I relate what I've seen and what I found out about that, I said, that's kind of some of the stuff that we ran into in Vietnam. Uh, they kind of got hung out to dry sometimes. Uh, all right. Well, um, I'll, I'll get uh, into your uh, enlistment and all that in just a moment, but um, what was your stepmother's name? Uh, Mary. Mary Ar Arnice. Mary Arnice. Mm -hmm. All right, and then uh, she had some children who were your step. Had 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 three sons when uh, uh, Dad married her, and uh, Bob, Bob being the oldest, Bob's a year older than I am, uh, and uh, Ronnie, Ronald, <laughs> and Larry. All right. And I, I was I was real close to Larry because I found out later that Larry was my half brother. And. Uh, well, Bob and Ronnie. I mean, we got along real fine back back then. Uh, like I said, we we only grew up like five years together, and then I I left, uh, went in the army, and got a big family. <laughs> when did you uh, enlist, and where? I volunteered for the draft here in Middletown in uh, March. No, I left in March. It was probably uh, in February of '68. And then where did you go? Where did you sign in? Uh, we were first our first bus trip was down to Cincinnati, uh, down to the federal building to uh, take the oath and take a physical. All right. Then where did they send you to for basic? We we went to uh, we got on the plane. My first plane ride was down to Fort uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, and I thought, well, okay, it, it's midnight I can't see a thing and, and it was cold <laughs> it was like I said it was in March and everybody said well if you're going down south it's going to be warm but, but it was colder down there and it was up here what kind of plane was it you flew down I, it was a prop commercial plane 
Yes, it, well, we flew out of northern Kentucky. Uh, I don't even think they called it Cincinnati uh, <laughs> Airport at that time, just uh, northern Kentucky, and it was, uh, I believe it was a DC-9 uh, prop jet. Okay. And uh, Turbo prop? Turbo prop. Uh, we got down there around midnight, and uh, th this is my first uh, instance with a drill sergeant, and we had about four or five running up down there trying to get us lined up. Uh, first uh, thing about uh, roll call and everybody telling their names and grabbing your bags, and uh, I see some of these uh, TV reflections popping back through my mind. I said, it's just like they were trying to imitate them or the, the TV was trying to imitate the real guys. <laughs> But anyhow, once once uh, everybody w was uh, accounted for, we got on a bus. Uh, they took us to a induction uh, uh, place there, and, and w we went through it again. Every, every, all the names had to be accounted for with a body. And then they picked out, uh, I don't know, first five or first 15 guys and put us on KP. And, and uh, somehow or another, I was, Got, got tied up in a potato line, peeling potatoes at, at the one or two o'clock in the morning. And we weren't, we weren't used to staying up that late at night doing that kind of stuff. At, at that time of the morning, that's when I did my most sleeping. It didn't happen until about seven o'clock the next morning that uh, once, once breakfast was done and the dishes were clean. <laughs> but dishes weren't dishes. We had the old metal divided trays that everybody got their food on one tray and you either ate it or somebody cleaned it and hopefully it was somebody else. It, it was an experience. It's something I never had but uh, I didn't I didn't have to do a lot of KP. How'd you get out of that? I volunteered for something else. <laughs> How long were you I, down there? We, we were there we were there at the, at the uh, induction center there for just about a week. And then, then from there, uh, they, they, had, they had us processed into a, a training company. Uh, took, my, uh, took my boot camp there in, in Fort Gordon. How long was that? That was uh, an, eight, an eight week course. That's when we first got, uh, you know, our uh, indoctrination to DIs. Our DIs were young guys. They were uh, Vietnam vets. They, they went in there and, and they, their first thing, their first little uh, uh, group session, you know, they said, we're not going to try to candy coat this stuff. We're not going to sugarcoat it. We're, we're going to tell you like it is. And that's, that was the beginning of life as I knew it growing up here in Middletown. Uh, it was kind of exciting because I was going to experience something I never experienced before. The, the fact that I'd left Middletown was uh, a, a big experience. Uh, the farthest I'd ever went was uh, on a uh, little family trip over in Kentucky to visit relatives and stuff like that, which I, I enjoyed a lot. but by gathering up with these other guys that I never seen before and, and you know it's uh, I was going in with the, uh, everybody that, that went in at that particular time was either from Ohio or New York and people said I talked with an accent that, that the, the big thing was trying to understand what those guys were saying it it didn't take a lot of time uh, I made some friends uh, <clears throat> made some close friends, uh, but we all didn't go to the same place after we got done with our boot camp. So uh, where'd, you, where'd you go after boot camp? I went to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, to, to, over around Columbia, and talk what, about hot. <laughs> what, what unit were you in uh, when you went to uh, Fort Jackson? Well, I was still in, the, still in the Army. That was where I went to, to do my AIT. From, from boot camp, that was when uh, they broke us down into what our mission was going to be. I went in as 11 Bravo infantrymen. Right. Yeah, some, some guys uh, had different things. I think, I think 
I, I don't really know what their MOSs were. Uh, I, I believe that at some point in time they gave us uh, a little one-on-one -on -one with the, uh, I'll, I, I, it fails to, to, to connect what, what they were. They were the people that determined how many other people, you know, you, you could have been into uh, Signal Corps, artillery, something like that, and, and I, it fails me on what they, what they were called. But, but uh, we, we had our little unit, as I knew it in, in basic training, it was broke up pretty quick. Right. There, there was only maybe two or three of us that, that went to infantry, and it, uh, it was an aptitude test is what they gave us. Because at one point in time we uh, we we went in one on one on these guys, and, and uh, that was when they said they were looking for helicopter pilots. You, you volunteered. <laughs> I, I raised my hand. I thought, well, that'd be exciting. Go up, uh, you know, learn how to fly a helicopter. Because that, they said it doesn't take a lot of genius. You know, it just takes takes more nerve than anything just to get up in that thing and and, and take off. But there was uh, six of us volunteered to to go over and, and take the test for it, and I think I missed missed it by one point or a half a point or something. Uh, you, your uh, your body makeup had a lot to do with it because the the, uh, the helicopters at that time I think they were all designed on a, on a certain amount of weight. Now when I went into the service, I only weighed a like 165 pounds. I'm a whole lot skinnier than I am now. Uh, Height-wise, I, I didn't change too much there. It, uh, the, my mentality, I, I was, I like to think I was flexible. Uh, I, I was open to anything they would throw at me. I guess they could say I was gullible. I mean, some, some of those guys said, you, you can't believe everything that you hear. I said, well, it's just like when they say, I need somebody, you know, have you ever driven a truck? Raise your hand. And, and this is one of the things that my step uncle told me. He said, don't volunteer for a truck driver job. You'd be pushing a wheelbarrow. And that's, that was the first thing they wanted was somebody with truck driving experience to go wheel a wheelbarrow. Well, you mentioned, well, that that you part mean, came in true. You mentioned an MOS, and 50 years from now, somebody watching your video, uh, what, what's an MOS? That was the job that you were going to be doing. Uh, that was the bulk of your training. Now, like I said, 11 Bravo, as soon as they say, well, you're 11B, you, you knew you were going to be a, you know, walking, the, walking the beat, just like a, a, a patrol cop down around here. But 11 Bravo, you're, you're out in the middle of, you know, you, can, you, you learn to look, look out for your buddy in front of you and hope you had one behind you because you were all on the same page. But once we got into the, uh, uh, the, the actual training part of what a, uh, a, a combat squad was going to be doing, each guy had his own job. We, we were all 11 Bravo, but we had our own little thing in a, in a uh, squad. Uh, I think a platoon was broke down into four squads. A, B, and a C, C uh, uh, and out of that squad you had either seven or eight guys. The, the, the back squad, the, the fourth squad, was uh, heavy weapons, either mortars, machine guns, or something like maybe just carrying extra ammo. I'm not sure how it was broken. I, I, didn't, get, I didn't get to the back squad. I was always up in the front somewhere. So you, you flunked the uh, test just barely. Uh, to be a helicopter it, pilot, and then it, what did you do? It didn't. Uh, it didn't break my heart. It's just that I, I had more. I had more training, uh, doing what I was doing, and the bulk of that training was uh, physical training. Just right. getting getting my body in shape to do what uh, my DIs wanted me to do. Well, how long were you there at uh, Fort Jackson? Fort Jackson was another uh, eight-week course. Then I mean, we we go? had. Uh, 
things that I didn't really really do well was uh, our, our uh, map coordination. Uh, when, when we went out on a, uh, they they gave they, they broke us down into three man teams, best I can remember. It could have been four, but one guy had the compass, one guy carried the map, and the other guy carried the flashlight. But if we had a fourth man, he was a pointer. He would always be in front of us, and, and we would follow him. Maybe he was the one that had the flashlight. But but uh, the guy with the compass had to stay with him. He gave him the head, him. He, he would tell him, go right, go left. And uh, he, was, he was taking his readings off the map. But now these were maps that were made up th through our, uh, uh, our, our DI leaders there. They, they knew where we were supposed to come out. We didn't. We, we hoped we would start here like point A and wind up over here at point B. Some of us wound up over here at point you know where and we didn't, we didn't know where that was at. It was, it was fun but it was aggravating because uh, it, it was the middle of the night. Uh, some of it was swamp, some of it was just hilly terrain and you know you, you wanted to hurry. Uh, None of us knew where we were at, so we couldn't uh, cheat, take a shortcut or something like that. We just had to kind of rough it. Uh, occasionally, we could run into somebody else that was out on this uh, maneuver, but they didn't know where we were at either. Uh, they didn't know where they were at if we run into them. That's, that was the whole thing. You, you weren't supposed to run into anybody. And, and later on, as we uh, got better, they, they would have... Uh, little surprises for us out in this course. I mean, uh, trip wires, ambushes, stuff like that. It was uh, to get us ready. I mean, you know, like, like they said, they didn't mince too much words about it. They said, you're going to Vietnam. You're, you're, some of you won't be coming back. But, well, that, they had to constantly drum that into us to make us aware that it wasn't going to be fun in games. Uh, and it wasn't. It, it was a it was a life learning experience, and, and uh, you know, for an 18 year old to to leave Middletown in those days that that had never uh, gotten any more than uh, what they got out of life at that point, it was a it was a challenge. So I, uh, where did you go from Fort Jackson? Fort Jackson. I I thought I was uh, going to get to come home for a 30 day leave. That's all, the, that's all the guys were talking about is getting a 30-day leave before we went to Vietnam. But Because, uh, you know, like, like I said, some of us, all of us didn't go to Vietnam. Some, some of the guys that, while we were in AIT, they got to, I, I can't call it brainwash, they, 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 they got to uh, experience some of the other opportunities that the Army was offering. And instead of being a draftee, they, they became an en enlistee. They volunteered for uh, extra duty and they would take another assignment. Uh, some of them went to Germany, some went to Korea, uh, some would go, they would stay home for uh, extra training. Now I, I thought that the, uh, the helicopter thing was going to be enough for me even though I knew where it was going to wind up over in Vietnam with all their helicopter operations. But it, it's probably in my best interest that I flunked out. <laughs> did, did you get your 30 days? No. What happened? <laughs> when it come time to uh, when it come time to leave, they said, well, "You're only going to get two weeks." I don't know what happened. It's, it's just that it wasn't just me. That there's a lot of us kind of disappointed because uh, the wife, my girlfriend, and I at that time we had made plans on uh, getting married at that time, but I was kind of, uh, how do I say it, I wanted to get married, but it, it was not the right time. Uh, th through, through some of my uh, DIs, uh, we had uh, gotten a little closer together than, than the recruit and DI. Some of them, they just kind of, they, they didn't, they didn't whitewash anything. They just come right out and told us. I mean, just just like you and I are sitting here. I said it's 
It's not going to be pretty. It's going to be different. But, but you're going to have some rough times. So you got to be pretty close to some of the DIs? I, I got to be some. That's why, like I said, age-wise, they may they may have been you know, five years older than me, six. I had my uh, the oldest marksmanship instructor there. He, he was uh, uh, an Army Grand Champion. And I, I don't know why, but it seemed like every time we went to the, the rifle range, he was standing on my back. And, and I don't know, like, like I said, I never uh, actually shot a rifle other than maybe a 22, a BB gun, stuff like that. But, but when he was standing watching me all the time, it's kind of like you, you're jinxing me. You know, I, I, I like to know you're there watching, but uh, when it comes time to qualify, uh, he, he really read me the riot act. and. and uh, he said, I thought you could do better than that. And I said, well, I, I thought I could too because all the time we practiced, I was I was getting uh, knocking my targets down. It wasn't so much uh, bullseyes. It was uh, they had knocked down targets. And I thought, well, if I can knock a target down, I'm doing good. But when it come time to qualify, we, we went through the same range, the same targets, but, but my score was not as uh, good as what it was in the practice. And when he asked me what happened, I said, well, well, Top, I said, I think I'm shooting the same sight pattern, the same targets. I said, I think my, my bullet is going through the holes we made last time. <laughs> <laughs> that cracked him up. He said, uh, your, your score is not going to change. <laughs> I said, well, don't it make sense? I said, all of us are shooting the, the, same, the same targets. I said, they they haven't been changed out, and it, 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 it at that time when he said it's not going to change, I said, well, what's going to happen when I get over in the combat zone? What am I going to shoot at? He couldn't answer me. He, he said, just keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> but but we we had it wasn't all uh, you know rough and tumble. We had some good times. Uh, he kind of he kind of took about four or five of us under his wings. And one weekend I remember uh, they had a, a an open an open time. Uh, that I think that was when they, they first opened up the PX for us. When, when I say opened it up, we were allowed to go to the PX whenever we felt like it. But there was four or five of us just sitting around on a uh, couple of porch steps in front of our barracks. And he come up and, and, and started uh, uh, intermingling with us. I want to say shoot the bull, but it wasn't, a, it wasn't that kind of a session. It was just, we were just talking uh, amongst ourselves, and he got involved and, and uh, w was talking about some of his experience because he was the oldest DI at that time. And he said, you guys are going to be okay. Well, that uh, stepped me up, you know, like, like if I was on a level five, that put me up to about an eight at that time. I said, well, okay. Our training is not as bad as we thought it was. I mean, we're 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 gonna we're gonna come out of this. And and uh, when it comes time to leave, that was at Fort Gordon. When it comes time to leave Fort Gordon and go to Fort Jackson, I, I kind of missed this guy tremendously. But it wasn't the last time that I saw him. When, uh, well, like I said, at this one particular time when we were there at Fort Jackson, they they had a. Uh, a big open, uh, it's kind of like uh, Bob Hope's USO show. They had a, a, a concert coming in for, for one of the parade grounds, and then it was a company wide uh, get together. The Cow Seals, uh, if you remember the group. They do. The Cow Seals were, were coming in to put on this uh, program. We had to march, it was kind of like a mile and a half in, in company formation over to this place and, and uh, let me go back a little bit. The, earlier in the week they had uh, marched us in to get shots. We all, uh, you know, everybody had to take their take their series of shots and stuff like that and, and I don't know which one it was but on, on the day that we we started out on that march, I, all I can remember is that it must have been 90 degrees uh, 
in a shade, and, and there was very little of that. But when we got to the uh, parade ground over there, I was uh, sick as a dog. I, I got to my DI, or one of my buddies went to the DI and said, he, he's not going to make it. So they, he come down and uh, talked to me. He says, uh, what, what's your problem? I said, I just feel nauseated. I'm just sick. I, I, I don't know if I was running a fever or not because it was so hot out there anyway. He said, can you make it back to the company area? I, I said, if I don't get lost, I can. But I said, I can walk. I said, I can't walk a straight line, but I can get there. So, and I did. He, he said, well, you're going, to, you're going on your own. I'm not sending anyone with you. So it was, like I said, about a mile or so, and, and I made it back. I don't remember how. And uh, I went back into our barracks, and I hit my bunk, and, and I was laying there when they come back. I don't know. I must have passed out, uh, went to sleep. Somehow or another, uh, when, I do, when I did wake up, I, I was under every blanket that they could put on me. I, was, I must have been shivering up a storm, and the next, next morning I, I wound up on sick call in a hospital. And I, I don't remember going to, to formation or anything like that. I just remember waking up in the hospital. And the first thing that came to my mind is they're going to recycle me. Now, I don't know if you know what the recycle was, but everything that I had a, went through up to that point, I was going to have to go through it again. And we were in our probably our seventh week, knowing that I only had like a, a week left, maybe a week and a half. And uh, I spent almost a week in the hospital. And uh, to to my best benefit, I didn't have to go be recycled. I just had to do a little catch up, and uh, you know, put my last last week in, and and I was able to. Uh, you know, walk through the parade ground and get my uh, certificate of <laughs> completion of AIT. I believe I believe we got our certificate. Some of us got uh, promotion. Did you we get went, one? I actually I, I did get two promotions in, in training camp, but it, it was kind of an un, unheard of thing because there was uh, more than myself that got a promotion. That was the year that they come out with the uh, the new insignia, the uh, E2, the, the PFC with a rocker under it, I, I believe that took the place of the old PFC patch, uh, the, the, PA, the PFC uh, in, insignia became the E2 patch, the, the new one became an E3, and uh, when I got out of AIT I was an a E3. Okay. And, and uh, I, I want to say, yeah, there, there was a, a an angel on my shoulder or, or somebody higher up with their hand on my shoulder or something taking care of me. The uh, Some guys, when we, uh, like, like when we left out of Cincinnati, uh, somebody down there were giving them armbands to, to put on their uh, sleeves to just to say, well, you're, you're going to be in charge. You, you, you take... Uh, so many guys under under your command. Somebody else takes so many guys. Somebody was always in charge at, at that point. Uh -huh. uh, it, it failed me when we first started this little conversation, but that's the way it was. Somebody was always going to be in charge of you. You had to listen to somebody else. And I believe at that point, if, if we had paperwork, that guy took the paperwork. Okay. We, they didn't trust us by just carrying our own papers. So you're, you're out of, uh, what, Fort Jackson, and you're an E3, and you graduated from AIT. Where do you go? I'm, I'm going on my, I'm coming back home for my two weeks off. Then where did you go? Just like they said, I went to uh, uh, Fort Ord, California to uh, be processed into. How did you get to Fort Ord? Train, bus, plane? I believe I come back down to, to the, the airport and, and boarded a plane. I, I haven't been on a train. I, okay. it, it could have been a bus, but... Uh, so how long were you out of Fort Ord? Roughly three days. And uh, uh, then you get sent to Vietnam. They sent us right over to Vietnam to uh, Benoit. Is that where you 
How did you get the uh, uh, we, ship or plane? We no airplane. They 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 wouldn't put us on a ship. That took too long. Was that commercial <laughs> or military? It was uh, it was a commercial plane, but it was, it was I, I don't think there was any civilians on it at all. It was uh, all, all military. Uh, I don't know how many. To me, it was one of the biggest jets I'd ever seen. It, uh, you know, whether a hundred and some people. So tell me again where you landed. We we were in Benoit. Uh, shortly there, that we you know, we deplane. We got out there and got in a formation. Somebody was there to meet and greet us, and uh, they had a. Uh, that that was when I first. Well, I was going to call it the cattle cars, but. Uh, we got used to the cattle cars uh, down in Fort Jackson when we were going to some of the longer ranges. Uh, they, they'd board us up on those cattle cars and, and haul us out, but we always had to walk back. So I, that's when I dreaded it. Well, some of the uh, some of the fellows that we've talked to from Vietnam tell us uh, what their first sensation was when they got off the plane. Mine's no different, but but I I had a. a, a I like to say that I had a good seat on the on the plane because I could look out the window and see how green and and lush the countryside was, and I seen all these water holes down there. I said, "Man, they got a lot of fishing ponds," but they weren't <laughs> <laughs> they weren't water holes. <laughs> they were all bomb craters. Well, how about the heat and the smell when you got off well, the plane? Well, the, the, they the, the heat was it was unbearable. Like like I said, we were in our uh, khakis. And khakis were supposed to be the coolest thing we had, but I, as soon as I, as soon as I got in in the doorway, I mean, I was I'd broke sweat and I was I was boiling by the time I got down to the bottom of the uh, steps. The uh, the smell it, it, it was it was different. I mean, it, it was not no stable, <laughs> but it was different. <laughs> it, it was one of those things that uh, w once you. Uh, once you experience, you never forget it. When you get off the plane, are you already assigned to a unit, or no, you no, get... no, no, no? We we uh, they they put us they put us all in a I, I want to say like a, a a POW camp. They put us all in one little spot there, and, and they said, "Listen for your names." So, said we're going to start calling names off pretty quick once we got everybody in. They may have uh, taken some of us and. and fed us or something like that, but uh, nobody left that little compound un until they were e either broken down into a unit or assigned to go someplace. Uh, some some of the guys, they didn't leave there for a week. And, and I think that I was uh, there at least three days. It, it's just who, who needed uh, recruits more. So your name's called and where do they send you? Up, up the road a little ways to another uh, uh, assignment. Another staging area. <laughs> another staging area. It, it was uh, that was when they put me into the Big Red One. Now the Big Red One was one of the closest units at that place. Uh, they they were probably 50 miles north of Saigon. Uh, my my first division there, uh, first division headquarters. And uh, that was uh, I, I, I didn't I didn't mention it before, but when in AIT, my uh, unit commander was his his main patch was a big red one. And from some of the one-on-one -on -one talks that I'd had with him, I thought, well, that's that's a unit I'd like to go to. I didn't realize all the history at that time that the big red one had, but one of the the main things of that is the Big Red One was in the, the, the Normandy. The uh, Normandy invasion. Normandy invasion. Uh, uh, why it didn't stand out to me? It it wasn't uh, it wasn't that important a as it is now. The uh, and like like I said, uh, Dad was in Normandy. My uncles were in Normandy, but I don't know that they went in in the, in the invasion, the first invasion group, whether they come in with with the supply uh, units. Because I, I remember uh, one of my uncles were saying they were uh, 
hauling ammunition to keep up with the uh, General with Patton. And uh, I was just talking to one of my cousins here a couple of weeks ago. He, he said his dad, he said he hated Patton. I said, well, I've heard rumors about stuff like that, but he, he said, said he hated him. He, he said uh, he was always wanting to go, 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 go. He said sometimes it was no, 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 no. <laughs> but, you know, the, uh, the hell on wheels that Patton had, I was in that unit when I come back home and went to Fort Hood, Texas. Okay. That was uh, strange, but it, it was, uh, I, I enjoyed that, but uh, for me to get home, it was a, uh, it was, it, it took more than I could do to get me home. It, it was, it, it did. It, uh, well, let's talk about that. You're, uh, you're, you're moved out in one of these cattle cars to, uh, well, they, uh, they took us about a, a, a mile, a mile. Oh. they loaded us on there and they took us about a mile up the, the, the road there a little ways and they put us in another little uh, motel and, and from there the, the guys were broken down into their individual units All right. and, and uh, there was uh, four of us we were going to the quarter calf the, the, we were already into the big red one but we were going to the quarter calf some of those guys were, would be going to signal corps artillery uh, whatever else they had maintenance uh, whether it would be uh, just uh, g general maintenance or aviation mechanics and stuff like that. The, uh, like I said, I was 11 Bravo. I was, I was, you know, Big Red One was noted for their infantry uh, units. Uh, they had uh, a, a lot of uh, uh, ground units there. What were you assigned to? Uh, I was assigned to the, at, at that time, I yeah. didn't know. Okay. But once I get, once I got up to the the main base camp there, that was when they put me into the quarter cab, okay. which I had no idea what the quarter cab was. Well, what what was what was your job assignment as part of the quarter cab? I, I didn't know at that time. Well, when once once I got in once <laughs> I got in there, well, like I said, me me and the uh, the four other guys, once we got up there and we went to the the. Everything goes through the headquarters, so we went to the headquarters there, reported in, and gave our paperwork in, and they said, take a seat. So at that point, that we're, you know, we're just sitting there, uh, I can't say lollygagging, but we were just visiting, and, and uh, somebody com comes out of the uh, commander's office, and he says, all right, so-and-so, you, you go over here, so-and-so, you stay right here, and they, they put, Two guys together. This guy over here, he's going to to somewhere else in the uh, the unit. And me, he says, you stay right here. You know, at that point, once they break us down to that, you know, I didn't know what to expect. Well, like, like I say, the the two buddies was going to the quarter cab also, but they were going to a line troop. Me, I I was going to the quarter cab. I was staying in headquarters troop. And, and the friend over here, I don't know where they put him, but he was he was still in the quarter calf somewhere. In, in fact, I never saw him again after after we left that uh, uh, that room. Uh, once they once once they uh, put him where he was going to go, me and the other two guys uh, we. we Kind of sat there and talked a little bit till somebody came and got got them. And they said, "Well, we're going to take you and put you where you need to be." And and with me, some somebody came and got me, and and they took me to uh, to my unit, which uh, we only my my the where I went with the headquarters unit. It was not the same place where the other two guys went. They went to a line troop. And we had A, B, and C troops, so uh, I, th I think they both may have went to the same troop. It's just that uh, I, I have trouble at, at this time no knowing who's where when. It's it's just when uh, when I got into uh, uh, headquarters troop, and they said you're going to go on a flamethrower. The only thing I knew about a flamethrower was what I'd seen in movies 
and we never done anything like that in, in uh, uh, training or anything with a flamethrower. The, the backpack units is what I was thinking. They said, no, you're, you're going on a Zippo. I said, well, I don't even carry matches. I said, what, what am I going to what am I going to do with a Zippo? I mean, she said, no, it's, it's not anything to do with smoking cigarettes. But, but uh, it, it uh, piqued my interest, so to say. It, it, uh, I wanted to know more. And uh, they said, well, you're going to find out more about it. They said, you're not going to wear it, but you might get tired of being in it. So in a couple of hours, they, they they got me up to where I needed to be, and uh, as we were pulling into this compound, I think it was a little place called Fu Loy. It was right on uh, Highway 13, right up from Zeon, and uh, that was where my unit was at that time. They, I believe there was another line troop located there, but the, uh, they, they scattered us out for a reason. And uh, once I got in there and, and went into the headquarters uh, uh, compound there that reported in so to say got my paperwork in and uh, saw the top sergeant he said this he called somebody I said take him over to to where he's going to be uh, uh, housed uh, we had a I ha actually had a bed and a footlocker but I didn't see it very much once I finished my first two weeks there in that in that uh, little compound we uh, went back over some of our, what they call, they were calling it jungle training. Stateside, we were just calling it uh, training. Uh, but, but we went out on a couple of little night, uh, uh, they called it an ambush, but we were going out on a night. Uh, Reconnaissance? A night, a recon or a hike. It, I don't know, if, like I said, if, if they, if they had gotten word that there may be some uh, uh, Viet Cong located somewhere, it wasn't too far outside of where we were uh, located. It might, might have just been a Vietnamese village that they knew nothing was going to happen ju just to get us acclimatized to what could happen. Uh, in my mind, when nothing happened, it, it, it eased my mind because the I can't remember if they gave us any live ammunition. They gave us the M16, but I don't, I don't remember getting any ammo. Now, now, I was very gullible back then. I, mean, I was open. I said maybe somebody's carrying it all, and they're going to give it to me when, when and if we get ambushed. That that should have been a like a red light going off or something like that. But uh, I think my wiring was dis disturbed. So I was, I was just going, going along. There was probably seven or eight of us in this little uh, patrol, uh, at least somebody in charge, uh, an E5, E6, or somebody like that, and, and somebody else that was covering the rear. But we went out, and we were probably gone for about two, two and a half hours, uh, walking, listening. Uh, somebody was always talking, but talking real low, you know, they weren't, they weren't loud, it's just so we could all hear them. And some, somewhere in the middle of this, uh, this little night hike, uh, we took a 15 minute break, and somebody, or s several somebodies, they, they, they were aggressors, or they were acting aggressors, and, and they come up on us. And they took a, uh, a prisoner, it so was it was make believe, but they took a prisoner. It wasn't me. Uh, I, I would have probably uh, went went ape shit on them or something at that time. I, they, they, I believe it was they took one of the guys that it, it was a planned thing, and they took one of the guys that had been there a while, and they they volunteered to be a prisoner. And, and at that point, once they once they left with him, and left us alone. The, the guy that was leading us there said, "What would you do in in this scenario if 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 you had ammo, what, who was going to be the first one to start shooting? Because uh, at that point they wanted to see what our mindset was. Uh, th then they come down and told us, from here on out, everything is going to be real. This this will be the last uh, make-believe 
that, that you're going to have. Did they tell you what they wanted you to do with that prisoner being taken? Uh, well, they brought him back. It's just like like, like the uh, the whole thing. They wanted to see where our mind was at when they saw when we saw this guy coming back. We we more or less knew that it was a. We had went through something similar to this in our training back in the stateside, but but this made it more real. This was well, it was the real thing. It's just you know. We could have all been wiped out just like that, as, as easy as they were up on us, uh, only because, uh, like, like I said, we were, we were out in an area where we didn't know where we were at, and we were still doing what we were told to be doing. After that, you just kind of had, you know, you, you'd been taught. You got you to fall back on what you'd been taught. And if it happened tomorrow, you're supposed to react to that situation, not what happened yesterday, what, what we just went through. But you're supposed to do what you can do to survive. And that's, that's when it kind of hit me that this is for real. The, the make-believe is over. So you get back to camp. And we, we got back to camp, and that's, that was when, uh, when I got first introduced to, to the crew that I was going to be going on on the flamethrower. Okay, so when did you get any training on the flamethrower? <laughs> or was that on-the-job training? It was on-the-job training. Uh, the guy, when I got put in with the crew, uh, it was later on that day, we, we went out to see you know, to, to the actual vehicle because I had to take some... Uh, gear, my duffel bag. I had to strip down my duffel bag, put what I wasn't going to use in that footlocker. And, and I had to, you know, had to have a couple changes of clothes, extra boots, uh, shaving gear. I, I, I could barely shave back then, but uh, I had to have it and stole my duffel bag. And, and at that point in time, you know, they kind of introduced me to what was going on, what my uh, uh, job duties were going to be while we were, we were there, and I was basically a, a, a gopher. If, if uh, you know, I didn't know too much about the mechanics. I, in fact, I didn't know anything. But if I tried to relate it to a, a car or a truck, there, there were so many uh, uh, oiling uh, points on the on the road wheels and tracks on that thing that it, it took you a couple hours to cover everything if you wanted it done right. Uh, if you wanted it done quick, then you just went down there and kept walking and looking at it. If it was uh, halfway, you know, if there was no, no damage there, then you were good to go. But if you, you saw some damage or signs of damage, you had to you know look at them a little bit closer. Well, let's talk about that uh, vehicle. Uh, was it total, totally tracked, or did it have some wheels on it as well as that? Well, tracks? that's that's what it was. You, it had wheels. They were called road road wheels, but the tracks they were, there was they were double wheels. I think they were seven of them on a side, uh, a gear a gear drive in front, and a uh, it was kind of like a dummy in the back. But there was a, a the track was made to to go over those wheels, but in the center of it was a uh, big piece of metal that fit in the track that kept it centered. It, it, it would only travel about a couple of inches. But as you go down the road, that, that track was basically, it was moving wherever it wanted to go, and that's, that's why the, uh, the drive wheel was in front. It kept you going, uh, and a trailer wheel in the back, it was, it was kind of like a, uh, well, it, it kept you in the back. The worst thing you could do is, is get in a firefight and get in soft dirt or something like that and throw a track. And we've done it several times coming out of that rubber plantation, uh, trying to keep up with the, uh, the, the, the main part of the, the body. Uh, as, as we got into a fighting formation, we were usually in the rear. Uh, they didn't want us up there uh, impeding the the guys with the 50s. We didn't have 50 calibers on our on our track. Well, we have them 60s, but they didn't want us getting caught up in the middle of anything. They wanted us to come up when that they needed us. They they knew when they needed us. We didn't. All we knew is that when we got into a fight, we we could tell by the the tank cannons 
or them M50s or the uh, 50 calibers. Uh, the the M60s they 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 throwed out a lot of ammo, but them 50 calibers did the damage. Uh, so were you uh, you had what? We we you had 60s. We had M60 on our turret, uh, and we had a a side gun that was an M60. All right. Uh, other than that, all we were carrying were, were ammo and napalm. All right. The, where was the napalm located with the, respect the, to where the, the driver sat? Well. <clears throat> the driver, the driver had his little compartment. It's just like you and I in this chair. All you had was two or three inches like this. He had this much room in front of him and no room behind him. He he was in a little, like a jump seat chair. He had a couple of uh, instrumentations in front of him, and then his chair would either go up or down. And when he went down, he was as low as he could go, and uh, he had those. Uh, Prisms, uh, they were located around the, his, his little uh, hatch where you could see out. They, they were uh, bulletproof, but you know, he, he pulled, his, pulled his hatch over and locked it down and, and he, he was good to go. It's just like being in a submarine. You, you got a, it's not a periscope, but they, they called them some type of scope. You, you could see out those prisms, and that was his job to keep those clean when 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 he wasn't doing anything else. They they were you had a hundred and uh, 160, 180 degree vision, and other than that, he kept his commo hat on, and and the track commander sitting right in the middle of the track. Uh, he and the track commander were in constant communication. Now the location where he was sitting uh, was on the left did front. That, did that rotate at all, or was that no? Fixed? That, that that was fixed. The only, only thing that could move on that was him. How many crew? How many crew besides the driver? The driver, track commander, and and the gunner. When I went first went in, that was my uh, my job. I was the gunner on the three man crew. And I, I said, okay. And I was trained in AIT and boot camp. I I knew what a gunner was supposed to do. It's not the same. You know, like you got gunners on helicopters, you got gunners on aircraft. That's not the same. I was supposed to keep the track commander supplied in ammunition. I was supposed to get it out of the bottom and, and keep it up up on the top so he could get to it. All right. Because, uh, like I said, the M the M60 was a, a belt fed. Uh, you know, raise that lid up in the back, reload it. Once once you got used to doing that, you could do it in about four seconds. You know, you, you had, you got two hands, one hand was doing something while the other hand was doing something else. The mind was, it, it wasn't thinking, because if you thought, you'd lose a second. And, and seconds were uh, all you had. Was there any protection on the vehicle for the napalm? Special uh, thickness all, steel only, or anything? The only protection for the napalm was the, the way it was housed inside the track. Uh, the napalm was, in a round tank, uh, it was probably a half inch thick was all, but uh, basically uh, that's all it was. The, re the rest of the operation in there were air tanks. Uh, we had napalm tanks, we had air tanks, and then we had a, uh, uh, a device on the side of the, uh, of the inside there that uh, once, you, once you throw a couple levers and a valve, and and you uh, pressurize those tanks. You you were ready to go. You were you were a napalm bomb at that time. The, yeah. the, the whole track was. Uh, in, in firefight, did you ever see one of those hit by an enemy? Not to the not to the extent that it was uh, out of commission. Now, now we, we all got hit at one time or other with uh, you know just bullets. And now the other uh, flamethrower that we had in our unit. Uh, it, it surprised me when I saw it did have a, uh, a RPG round in the, in the side. Now it was on the side where the driver sat. Uh -huh. And uh, once I saw that, I thought, well, I don't think I want to be a driver. <laughs> uh, I, I knew from past experience, that, and that experience came a little bit later, we, we had probably blown uh, two power packs in, in my short 
service time, and, and that's the the engine. And, and we had to go go. We couldn't go anywhere. We were set, left sitting on the side of the road waiting for uh, uh, one of, one of the big uh, uh, re tank recovery units. Uh, the the <laughs> the the, uh, the tow the tow the tow truck. <laughs> to come and get us and, and pull us in because they, they didn't have anything to lift us up at that time. They, uh, we didn't, when we went out for a, a convoy escort or, or something like that, we didn't take one of those along. It, it was just, we, we were moving that convoy and we weren't stopping for anything. If we got into a fight, well, we would, we would fight our way through it, but if we stopped, we had a whole different operation to go through. But if that convoy got stopped, we had to go into a, a whole different mode. Basically, we were out there to get up that road and get that convoy where it was going. The, okay, the, well, let, let me take you back. Uh, you're, you're now uh, assigned to this, uh, this flamethrower and, uh, you know, kind of chronologically take me through your experiences there in, in Vietnam till you get uh, well once really once I got assigned to the track uh, <laughs> me or, or one of the others but basically uh, the track commander's duty was to make sure I knew what I was supposed to be doing he, he was the one in charge and like I said we were uh, I didn't say it but uh, I think I told you before we were all within two or three years of each other in age so it wasn't that I'm the youngest, I was the dumbest, but I mean, I was dumb to the part where I di didn't know a, my first thing about it until they told me. So as, as they're telling me what I'm supposed to know, what I'm supposed to learn, and, and what I picked up on my own after that, well, that, that's, that's all right. That's where I am today. Uh, track commander, he, he gave me you know his, le his level, what he wanted me to do, when to do it, and that thing. The driver, he gave me a little bit more because he said some somewhere he was looking to be a track commander at some point. So he wanted to let me know what duties I needed to know as far as learning how to drive this vehicle. And he went into a little bit more, uh, you know, because I would probably be a driver w before he got to be a track commander. You'd have to know how to operate that uh, flamethrower. Uh, well, that was the track commander's duty. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, that. That wasn't my duty at that time. Like I said, I was a gunner. I, I was the the low man on a totem pole going in. Uh, I I picked up a lot just by watching. Uh, that's the way I'd done a lot of stuff over there just by watching. Uh, but but the driver, uh, it, it's ironic. His name was Robinson also, but we weren't related. Uh, but I ran into him one time down in Fort Hood, Texas, when I come back home doing my last six months. But uh, I got into this unit in uh, the August, pr probably about the end of August, uh, when they assigned me to the 1st Infantry Division. And, and by the end of September, we, we were, I didn't know it, but, but we were getting ready to go out on our first field exercise. Uh, from the the beginning of September to the end of September, they had moved uh, the Big Red One base camp up north to, uh, um, I think it was up to Lake Hay. Now, it, it's in that book that, that, that you're reading, uh, but uh, somewhere, somewhere in there, I, I had pretty much got a, a grasp on what I was supposed to be doing. If, if we got into a firefight, I, I thought, well, I can handle this. I, I had a, uh, we had a, uh, a metal can on the side. It was a, uh, I want to I call it confiscated, but it had been a, uh, one of those uh, utility cans that they, they brought hot meals out in. It, it was, uh, it, it became a, uh, a catch-all for magazines. Uh, lo loaded magazines, maybe a, a, a couple of M79 rounds, and I, I kept thinking, why don't we have more? Why don't we have a, a commonplace that we're not supposed to have those? All we're supposed to have is uh, 
uh, magazines, ammunition, or, or personal weapons. And I said, we don't get an M79 launcher, we don't, uh, but we had one. He said, no, we're not supposed to have one. We had uh, grenades, we weren't supposed to have them, but we had some. Now when you say we had some, you mean your tank? The, the, yeah, the, the, my crew. Okay. And I thought, well, I'm kind of taking a personal inventory here. Well, we only had a couple here or, or a couple of these. And I said, why don't we have more? He said, we're not supposed to have those. Well, I said, does it hurt if I go gather up more? You know, is more better or is more worse? He said, well, it, it's only worse when you need them and don't have them. I said, okay, when I, find, when I come across something, I'm bringing it home. So that, that was what I became over there was a scrounger. Uh, we wound up packing a lot of stuff that we didn't need, but when you needed it and didn't have it, that was another thing. But we, we, if I thought it was going to help me in a fight, I would take it and, and you know, strap it down someplace. Nobody said nothing to me about it. Are you as confined in the, in the interior as the driver? No. I, I, I had a, uh, well, about a, a three by four, I call it a cat hole, in the back of the, I was directly behind the track commander and he was centered on the track. Uh, the driver, he couldn't do anything. Right. He he probably couldn't even get a hand out over the top if he wanted to shoot a uh, a pistol or a, you know just put his rifle out there and spray it because because uh, he would just be wasting ammo at that point. But he was the most vulnerable guy in the in the in the leader because if if, if they want to stop that track, all they got to do is put an RPG round in the side of that and he's done. The, the other part of it, they don't want to kill him, then they can go to the other side and put RPG around over there where the motor's at, the, the power pack. That will stop it too. But, but they're in between the, the motor housing and where that driver's at is only a, a piece of pop metal, probably about as thick as this board here. It's not very much. And I was uh, telling you about the RPG hole I saw in the other AP, uh, flamethrower, the APC, and that's what it is. That's all the uh, flamethrower is. It's on an APC chassis. It, it's it's got the same uh, engine housing, the, the same uh, uh, compartment up there where the driver sits, and everything from from there back. It's the same thing that the uh, uh, a, a combat troop would have. You know, going to a fight. You you got a, a, a usually it's a a platoon or a squad, I, I think it's more on a squad unit, would, would set in the back of one of those. There's seven or eight guys on each side of the center, and, and in the middle of that, they've got ammo boxes. Now the APC is Armored Personnel Carrier? Armored Personnel Carrier. And, and basically, they've got a swing outdoor, or the driver, with a, he's got levers up here that will lower the whole back end down on the cable system. Now in training, that's that's the way we got our training. That, that uh, when we loaded up, got in and got situated, we were supposed to exit that uh, track in a certain way. Nobody went straight out. They would take a step out and they would go left or right because you were going out in a squad organized fighting formation. When we got to Vietnam, that that was went by the wayside. The, the squads were. Uh, your armor, your armament was different. The, the squads were different, even though they had the basic same uh, drill that, that they did, that they learned statewide. Y you uh, adapted when you got over there. Th your squad leader saw to that. That okay. they would, they would, uh, how they said it, they would deprogram you. Okay. Well, take take us out uh, to your first. You started talking about your your first. Uh, my, my first uh, exercise when I got in country is uh, we got word that we were going to be going out uh, probably two days before we actually went. So that gave us two days to organize, get, get everything we needed that we thought we were going to be needed because they told us that we don't know when we're coming back. And, and that was always uh, in the back of my mind. I said, if I'm going out, 
were we going for an hour? Were we going for a day? And the other guys had been all, been all through that. They said, uh, just take enough for two or three days. I said, okay. I said, what do we do about water? He said, we got water. We'll have water. Well, okay. But I, I gathered up all the canteens that I could find, which was about three, and I made sure we had three days worth of water. It come in handy sometimes. The, uh, the other time, food, uh, they carried a, a, a box of sea rations on the track. And, and sometimes when I found out that's all we had, sometimes I'd gather up more. It, out in the field, some of that stuff was easy to come by. In, in a base camp, it wasn't. But uh, it, it, you, you could only get uh, uh, equipment that, that was... Uh, that was allotted to that, you. That was allotted to you that you were supposed to have. But if you thought you needed more, uh, you might be able to trade a, trade some sea rations, trade something else for, for this or that, yeah, there's, you know, for, for guns or something like that. But Why was it easy to uh, get uh, that stuff out in the field as opposed to base camp? Uh, because it wasn't, uh, it wasn't all paperwork. It would come out on a chopper and it would be there in a pile. Come and get it, boys. Yeah, that, that kind of thing right there. Or if you had malfunctions and weapons and stuff like that, it wasn't that easy to have somebody, to an armorer out there or somebody. You either had to fix it yourself, be able to fix it yourself, or discard it. And, and nobody wanted to discard a weapon that could be uh, taken apart by the enemy and reused against you. Well, how'd your first uh, reconnaissance? Or well, first that, that, that's where I'm at now. Once we got uh, word that we were going, they, they, they said, you're going out with uh, either A troop or B troop. We, uh, they said, uh, they put us out in the north gate and said, wait, they'll be, they'll be coming through. Well, we knew where their area was uh, as of where we were located in the, in the base camp. So uh, we went out on the main road and, and, and got up to the north gate and went, uh, went outside the gate and just pulled off to the left like in a, uh, the old pull-offs they had going down I-75. Well, we, we waited there about a half an hour when uh, we heard the rattle trap of the tracks coming. Uh, I said, well, here they come. And uh, I think there was probably about 12 vehicles come through there. And, and uh, you know, they got on the radio and then they call, called the track commander's call sign. And they said, uh, all right, eight, nine, or you pull in behind. So that meant we were gonna be eating dust. It's just like uh, last wagon in the wagon train. You, you're, you're the tail end. And they said, at that point, we became the, the, the rear gunners. Uh, and little did we know at that time, but the, the, the line troop leader, we were going out to, uh, our division commander was up somewhere north of where we were at, and, and I don't know if he was checking out an area we were supposed to be going into, or, or for whatever reason, but he was in his uh, helicopter and he got shot down. Mm. And, and this was up somewhere around the uh, uh, Cambodian border. He didn't survive that. He didn't. Crash. He didn't survive it. None of his uh, uh, men that were in the chopper survived it. But for me, it was my first opportunity to get out into that country. It wasn't my only opportunity, but uh, once I was able to see what we were going to be facing, it it, it didn't scare me as much when when we went back into it. Uh, I believe at this time we we may have picked up some uh, uh, journalists because it seemed like every time we go out we we had an on, the only amount of room that we could carry extra people and I thought why do we need them if we're looking for a fight I mean to me they're in the way but that wasn't my call it's, you know somebody <coughs> had to carry them and, and uh, we were out there in the in the countryside, wheeling around with, with these extra people, and uh, uh, I didn't have to deal with a lot of questions. It's just something that, you know, I wanted to be focused on where we were at, not not trying to worry about if they got good pictures or something like that. The pictures would come. But we never did get to the, uh, the actual crash site. It came over the radio that uh, we weren't the only ones looking, that there, there were some uh, ground troops uh, that were out there, uh, and, and they actually... 
uh, come across the, uh, the, the crash site. Uh, they come across the crash site before we did. Uh, when we got to, when they could hear us coming, they they more or less told us, you know, take a defensive perimeter around us so they, it, we, they could ease up on their what they were doing because they at that time they were in a defensive perimeter. So we went circled them up and, and uh, you know kind of gave them some cover and, and they, they went about doing what they had to do with the... Uh, they were able to recover the bodies. Uh, the bodies and everything and uh, investigating. Uh, and, and at that point our our duty was done for that day. Okay. Uh, we, we, we went uh, at, as everything got cleaned up, as night started approaching, we uh, broke our circle and we went uh, Someplace else. Uh, whether we went north, we couldn't go. We couldn't go west because that was Cambodia. We we were already in a spot where we didn't know exactly where we were. So uh, we we were going north, and then we were going to go and break break them back to the east and uh, try to get back on that uh, what they call the uh, Thunder Road. So you uh, you already had orders. You couldn't go into Cambodia. That was well. We we didn't know it so much at that time, but it it. As things got down to me, since I was so low on the totem pole, that was when they said, we're not allowed in Cambodia. Did you ever go in there? Uh, not unknowingly, I mean, or not knowingly. I mean, yeah, we were we were there a couple of times. Uh, as, as my, the next time we went out, uh, it, it was the next time that we went out on a field exercise that, uh, that, that was when I lost my driver and my track commander. We we went uh, we went back up the uh, what, what they call Thunder Road. We were on a uh, search and destroy. We had the same uh, A troop, but we had B troop with us also. So we we doubled the amount of uh, armament, uh, firepower. Uh, you know, we were we were going for the big bucks at that point. Uh, only thing is, we didn't know what we were going to run into. Somebody may have, you know because they sent so many of us. But when we got there, we went, uh, we started out up there in the Michelin rubber plantation below uh, uh, Loch Ninh. We cut off and when we started back around toward Cambodia again, we, uh, oh, we got probably a quarter mile inside that uh, plantation there and run into uh, uh, sniper fire. It, 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 one of the lead elements up, up there was uh, had, had come across the bunker. Uh, it was it was later that I actually saw the bunker, but it, it was when we uh, they they called us. I don't know. They they probably spent three hours trying to. Uh, as it came out, I think there was only three NVA or three uh, Viet Cong in there, with small arms and maybe a machine gun, trying to get those uh, enemy out of there. We we come up on a come in in a single file, and then when they told us to, you know, we had to come out in the line. Well, we started getting through the plantation, making a sweep, and they told us on the flamethrower get off to the to the one side, e either right or left side. We at that time we were guards. We, we we didn't want they didn't want us into the fight. They wanted us to be rear guard. So instead of being in the middle, they put us on a on a side. And uh, it, it seemed like for three hours along, it was ta da ta ta ta, boom ta da ta ta. The 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 cannon fire from the tanks couldn't dislodge them. The, the uh, machine guns and then when you got six fifty caliber machine guns coming after you, that couldn't dislodge them. And and the amount of uh, rubber trees that we tore up. Finally, they decided uh, we're going to call in an airstrike. Well, airstrike was easier to control than it would be to call in artillery. Uh, if they'd have called in artillery, they'd have probably got us. They're probably more precise, isn't it? But the airstrike, they, they knew right where it was, but they'd, they'd cleared out enough trees that, that uh, the jets could, could uh, find them. They came in in about a half an hour and they dropped, uh, I think they made two runs, they dropped four bombs. No napalm at that time. We, we we were the last uh, the last straw because uh, about an hour after that they 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 tried to uh, 
send a, a, a point track up front and they, they came under fire again. They backed back off and they said, all right, we're calling a flamethrower up. That was my first opportunity to see us in operation. Uh, we, we went up, you know, we, we were easing ourselves up, trying to draw far, because at that point we had, we had two tanks on each side of us, both guns uh, trained on that, on that bunker. When we got within, uh, I'd say probably 50 yards, that's when we, we ignited. We, we, we lit them up. Uh, and this is this is the way that I gained my experience. The uh, the track commander at that point he shot a he gave it a little little side sweep of napalm right right in that bunker. And when he when he come back around, that's when he ignited the next one and, and lit it. He gave it another little sweep, and what was already in there, that's when it kind of went up. And at, at that point, we we expended the whole. Uh, reserve that we had left, which was roughly 300 gallons of napalm. We had black smoke rolling uh, when, when they got in there. All all it was left was the the, the charred remains. Uh, we had a couple of uh, uh, secondary explosions of whatever ammo or whatever they had in there with them to for protection. It it went up to. But the tanks and the bombs and the machine it, guns could not get them out. No. Uh, and that was the other thing that uh, our people wanted to see how well they were uh, entrenched, dug in, if they had a, a, a rear exit. Uh, but at that point, no, there was no rear exit. It was just them right there uh, doing what they do best. Was it concrete? No, it was it was all uh, dirt, dirt and uh, you know. Logs, Logs uh, you know, j just what they cut out of the rubber plantation. Now they didn't, I can't say that they cut the rubber trees down, but uh, it, it didn't look like that's what happened. It looked like the, the, the tree, uh, the tree trunks and stuff that w was there was, was what the, uh, the bombing had, uh, mm -hmm. had done and what we had done in the process. But uh, they were good at what they did, uh, especially in their, in their uh, excavations. Uh, you, uh, you you mentioned you lost your your driver and your well that uh, that was after after this skirmish here we went up to uh, went up there when we come out of there we went up to uh, uh, the other side of Loch Nan on, on the outside of the uh, rubber plantation once we got to the outside where it was clear uh, we came under fire. Now it wasn't just us. We we were still in the back end of the the, the, oh. the command there, but the lead the lead vehicles coming out, uh, they took fire and it come back on the radio. You know, be prepared for fire. And you know, we don't know what we're getting into. Well, we, we got out, got on a road, and uh, we hit that road, and we got uh, oh maybe from here over to Central Avenue, and and we we saw there was a, an infantry outfit uh, in bunkers and, and uh, you know they they were set up there for a while because they had concertina wire set up and that's when we uh, we got artillery rounds here or artillery we had uh, the 155 uh, artillery battery in there and some 105s uh, and, and they were set up for a while and we fought our way in there and we went in between how the uh, the infantry were set up. We went in between each each one of their bunkers to uh, strengthen it, you know the whole compound up. Was I, I told one of the guys that uh, we're going to be here for a while, aren't we? And they said we don't know. You know, it's just you know once once we left that other fight, they knew something was going on. They they just didn't want to tell us what it was at that point. And uh, like I said, it might have been there just for a, uh, you know, they were they were in the uh, in the right of way, and they they were trying to slow us down. They didn't want us over there where we went to after that. It it took us all day to get them out of there, and you know it didn't take us very long to get where we were we were going to be, but we stayed there for over two weeks. 
Well, how did you get your uh, your flamethrower resupplied? They brought our they, they brought a, brought a Chinook in with, and uh, we had a uh, our uh, it was a, like an old deuce and a half or, or uh, might have been a little bit bigger service unit. Uh, only only thing was it was it was wheel drive. They brought it in. It, it had mixers on the back end of it with the uh, whatever. Uh, it could only carry so much uh, foo gas and so much uh, napalm mixture at any given time. Probably enough for two two services. And uh, well, the first thing they did once it hit ground was mix us up a, a, a new batch, which we got loaded up as quick as we could. Went back into in the line, and they didn't they didn't mix it up because they didn't want it to to be hit by accident or anything like that. So if it's going to get hit, all it's going to do is uh, uh, blow up the gas that's there. Napalm mixture itself was nothing. And uh, it didn't uh, <laughs> it didn't take us too long before we got to use that extra mixture, uh, probably a couple of days, but when, like I said, after about two weeks, we'd all, we were all getting kind of bored are you still up near Loch Ninn? We were on the outside of Loch Ninn. <coughs> uh, in fact, I've got in my bag that book. I'll show you where we were at. That uh, Far Base Rita, they called it. There were two far bases up there, Rita and uh, Julie. I mean, I don't know which one was the which. I think Rita was the uh, southernmost. Julie was, uh, you know, maybe five miles, ten miles north. Somewhere about two or three days before we got hit, Julie was getting getting hit, and all that night uh, I don't think anybody slept. But you you could see the uh, uh, the, the gunfire. You know you could hear the gunfire. You could see the, the cannon explosions, uh, the the firefight. It was tremendous. Uh, somebody on the on the radio was kind of keeping giving us a uh, like a football. Right. Type uh, keeping us informed about what's happening, you know, uh, and, and I believe at the same time we had the, the infantry unit that was there. They had some uh, uh, outposts for uh, listening posts and stuff like that, letting letting their commanders know what what if anything was was coming our way. But two days before we got hit, I'm I'm sitting up there in a in a turret of, of the track. It, it wasn't my track at that time. I was just sitting there doing my guard duty, and I'm, I'm looking out this way, and, and I know that when we where we set up, it was a road. We come in out of the, the rubber plantation on this road, and it, it kept going when we stopped. About 15 minutes. Got about 15 minutes. Okay. Well, the, uh, I saw lights. And, and I asked one of the one of the other guys. I said, "Do they have fireflies over here?" I said, "If if they don't have fireflies, I said we got traffic out here." And about the time I'm pointing like this, the lights go out. They they said, well, "Where are they?" I said, "Well, okay, I'm I'm pointing out here. Right at the end of my finger was where I saw them. They're probably about 800, 900 yards out in there. But that was jungle. You you had to differentiate what was out there. So." We didn't know where, what, how the road, how the terrain went out there. We just kind of let somebody else know that we saw something. We didn't know what it was. And they said, "Okay, just be vigilant." And nothing happened that night. Nothing happened the next night. But the night after that, all hell broke loose. And uh, that was when my my driver got shot first. He he wasn't he wasn't in the hatch or anything, but he was in the in the back end where I usually sit, and he he got shot in the side. Uh, my track commander was up up in where he was supposed to be up in the turret, and I don't know if I I was on the ground. And and uh, when I heard him holler, I went up over the side and got back in there, and I, I helped try to get him patched up the best I could. And, we had a we had a medic at that time, but, but he had been running around helping other people, and I kept hollering, "Doc, where are you at?" 
And finally he said, I'm, I'm coming, I'm on my way. Well, he got up in there and he said, we got to get him down because the, the aid station was behind us about uh, 20 yards. He said, can you help me back here? I said, yeah, let me get off here. Because everything was okay at that point, I thought, and I left the track commander there with, I kept putting ammo cans up there in case he needed them. And we got him back to the aid station. And when I got back up in there, I, I couldn't find a track commander. And his name was Dwayne. I said, Dwayne, where, where are you at? I heard him go, oh. And I, I looked down inside the turret, and he was he was laying down there. I said, are you hit? He, he, did, he wouldn't answer me. So I wiggled, a, wiggled around and got down in there. And, and, and I said, Dwayne, I said, are you hit? He, he said, no, I, said, I can't move. He had uh, had frozen. I mean, by frozen, uh, I guess he just got scared. Mm. And and by, by the time uh, I got him up, and the doc got a hold of him, pulled him on out, and that, that was me and the doc at that time. Uh, when, when doc got him over to the aid station, because I couldn't go at that point, got him back behind us. I had a uh, a translator come up. He got in there and he he manned the sixty over here. I'm on the turret gun, and at that point we're we're putting bullets out as fast as we could put them up there. Couldn't see what we were shooting at. We were basically shooting at the uh, tracers or whatever was coming at us. We we were just you know laying a, a field of fire out there. Are you out there by yourself? I mean, no, we okay. We were on a, we were on a line. We were, line, we were okay. on a perimeter. All right. So, so you know we weren't just the only one. We had uh, infantry bunkers on either side of us, and and I think a. The tank was the next vehicle over there, but I had an APC on the other side of that, and then another bunker, and then another uh, APC. So that's that's the way we were set up. How about how did your drive? Did your driver survive the driver that survived? Driver survived. Like like I said, I ran into him uh, down Fort Hood, Texas, uh, in, in my last six months of duty. Well, that duty. was Richardson. Uh, no, his his name was Robinson. Robin, Robin Richardson. <laughs> um, Robinson. Uh, Dwight Dwight Robinson. <laughs> Uh, but uh, the other one, Dwayne Anderson, uh, I never saw him anymore after that. Uh, he hadn't been hit. He just he had he hadn't been hit. Just uh, you know, I, I was I was thankful for that. The and like I said, Dwayne uh, Dwight survived. Uh, but it, it, it's uh, you know, I don't know. Probably w we stayed in that area for for another month. They 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 called in uh, B fifty two strikes around us. Uh, that's not the uh, the only fight we were in, but that was the worst one we were in at that particular time. Uh, we kept getting uh, uh, what do they call it? They they, they kept wanting to wanting to send sappers. They wanted to get those big guns out of the way because they the the one five five artillery pieces they could travel for a while. Mm -hmm. Uh, the 105s, they weren't worried too much. That was the 105s were the ones that uh, kind of put an end to that because that was when they uh, told us to button up our hatches that they were going to lower the barrels on the 105s and start uh, shooting beehive rounds. Uh, and I said, "What's a beehive round?" He said, "Get down inside there, you'll find out." Uh, and I found out the hard way, but it's it. Uh, thankful for the artillery. Uh, well, the beehive is just but almost like shrapnel inside it it, it, it was a they were kind of kind of like a, a needle point dart or something like that but it had the, like a blade in it and once it went out there it, it was going every which way it, it would tear you up the, uh, the the other part of it was that we didn't leave right away we, we stayed there for probably another two weeks and at that point we changed our positions there were bomb craters inside when we got there, but we basically, we were trying to, they wanted us to dig dig a, a, a bunker like the, uh, the, the uh, infantry company had already had bunkers there. They wanted us to get down and sandbag our, Sandbag. our tracks up. So we moved around to one where we could, uh, we could get in this old uh, uh, bomb crater and then we started sandbagging up that point. And when those uh, B-52 strikes came over, they knocked their sandbags over. <laughs> that was more aggravating than having to feel them, is, is having to, well, we said, well, we're not going anywhere, so we'll just use them, use them for what they are, and, and then when, when we do leave, 
we'll run over them. <laughs> well, before we run out of time, let's let's take a look at your hat. What uh, you've got a couple of, of uh, mementos on well, there. Show us what those my, are. My purple heart. I show the my, my purple heart. And I don't look at that as a memento. It's some people say that's a hero's award. I said I don't look at it like that. I just look at it when I come home. I'm just glad I'm home. That's just something that, you know, it, it's an earning. Uh, this is the, uh, it's, it's the 50 year uh, Vietnamese yeah. thing, uh, the conflict badge that they, they, they gave us. And if, if I got to be happy about anything, it was my CIB badge. Uh, that meant you only get those if you come under fire and return fire. I mean, every everybody don't get those. You can you can get a, a first first class infantry badge, which is the, uh, the the bright part down here. But when you get the wreath around it, it, it means more. Uh, that that is the first thing I think I saw on my dad's uh, class A uniform. Is he, he had that CIB badge on there, and I think that's the first thing that I destroyed. Oh. I did not know that, but. Uh, it, it, it is what it is. If I had it to do all over with, I wouldn't have done it. I'd try to ask more about it, but he what's, was. What's the other one? Uh, my first infantry division. That, that's just the, uh, all that is. And What's the ribbons in front? Oh, uh, that, that's, that, 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 that's, that's my national defense ribbon. Every, everybody goes into the service gets one of those. Uh, and these are the uh, Vietnamese, uh, I can't remember, but it, it, if you were in Vietnam, you got both of those. And some guys, depending on what, what their uh, tour of duty constituted, I knew I was gonna be in for a year. Uh, some guys, uh, they would extend their tour of duty uh, for a short time in order when when they were done, when they got stateside, they were finished. I elected to, when my tour of duty was up, I elected to come home. When did you come home? In, in August of 69. Uh, I, had, I had already been wounded and I had spent a uh, uh, little over a month in the hospitals. What wound did you get? Pardon? What wound did you have? I had wounds in my, my fo right forearm here, up in my elbow, and, and right up in here in the side of my head. From what? Uh, well, shrapnel the best that I can remember. It, it was either RPGs or mortars. Uh, in, in this uh, same area of operation we'd been into earlier, it was probably about four months later, uh, we had been in this area several times. But, but this one particular time when we got back there, they had uh, built another uh, infantry uh, unit base. They brought in man-made foxholes, uh, bu uh, bunkers, set them in, sandbagged them over, and uh, put some, uh, put our infantry now, our, our U.S. guys that had put, put a, uh, made a little base camp there. We were coming out of the, the surrounding area there and we went in and, uh, and made our own little uh, defensive uh, circle there on the outside of theirs and, and uh, uh, about one or two o'clock in the morning we got hit. It went, started out with uh, RPGs and mortars and uh, along about daylight when, when it got to be where we could figure out what was going on that uh, they, they brought uh, dust off choppers in and and I went out on the last chopper, but uh, as I was in the uh, evac hospital at Lycae, they, they come in and told us that the fight wasn't over, that they, they had uh, started it again after the last uh, helicopter went out. That kind of hurt me more than anything because I, I kept thinking I had fight left in me. Uh, of course, when I left, there was nobody to take over my track. Uh, uh, they, they, they had to take somebody off the other flamethrower at that time and put over there and, to operate it. Like I said, anybody could drive it, but anybody couldn't 
work the operations in it. So where did you leave from and where did you come to? Well, when when I when I left Vietnam and came home, I, I, I got my 30 day leave and the wife and I were uh, getting ready to go to Fort Hood, Texas. And I think the the last bit of mail I had uh, come in, I got uh, promotion orders. To what? I, I went from uh, E4 to E5. When did you get your E4? Because you had an E3 I, in the well, States. Well, I had, I got, I, I can't remember when, when I got spec four. It was uh, sometime, I think, in like November of, of that year, maybe December. Uh, when did you get married? I got married uh, on my on my last week of my two week. Uh, uh, what I thought I was getting thirty days, and I only got two weeks. I got married on uh, August the ninth. That was that was my dad's birthday. So you're married when you're all the time you're over there in Vietnam. I, I, I was, and, and I was I was uh, wanting to get that in there that I tried to talk my wife uh, into waiting, and, and and she said I don't want to wait. I said. Uh, you may never come back. I said, that's right, I may never come back. I said, well, we'll be married this long. I said, well, okay. When you came back, where did you come back to? I came back to Middletown. No. You came from Vietnam. Where did you land? Oh. Uh, California? In California, we went into the Oakland base out there and uh, uh, deprocessed, de uh, went through the deprogramming part there, did the paperwork, emptied out, uh, my duffel bag, and, and they were looking for propaganda. They said, or propaganda, but the contraband. <laughs> no, nobody that I knew had any contraband. But uh, they they took all my jungle fatigues, and and then fitted me out for stateside uh, fatigues. So then you went to Fort Hood. Come back home for my thirty days, and uh, her and I we loaded everything up that that we had that we could get into our car, and started down Fort Hood, Texas. And you're in there six months. Uh, that's where I did my last six months. On on the way to Fort Hood, I got into a, a five car pileup down in Paducah, Kentucky. We we were the fifth car in that chain. Uh, no, we we were the fourth car. We the, the car behind us was completely total. Ours was completely total. I had passed this guy up. Uh, Two or three miles around the around the bend down there, and, and uh, he was driving a dump truck. Well, when I look back into my mirror, what little I could see, there's that truck piled up behind us. And the only thing I think saved us was he was hauling sawdust. All right. Over pause. Okay. Uh, can we uh, have a little break for a moment? Okay, we just took a little break here from this interview with uh, with Dick, and uh, we're here at the uh, um, Cincinnati uh, State Community College interviewing uh, Dick Robinson uh, for uh, the, the uh, Veterans History Project, and today is March 30th of uh, 2018. Uh, Dick, uh, you know, we've got you, uh, you, you survived that crash down on your way to Fort Fort Hood down at Paducah. Now, uh, w when were you discharged from uh, the military altogether? Uh, it was at about like now, Mar uh, tail end of March in 1970. All right. Uh, now I ironically, I got wounded on March the 28th, <laughs> 1968. <laughs> and uh, um, you. You and your wife uh, had some children. You got three kids. Uh, uh, tell us what their names are and uh, how old they are. The first one was uh, Rick. Okay, and we, she was pregnant with him when we got out. That was the main reason why I didn't stay in. I was uh, getting all these reenlistment uh, re-up talks and stuff. Like they promised a lot of money, and uh, I said, "No, I'm going home." Uh, the wife wants to see her mom. So we, we come home. I had a job waiting for me, and I went back to work. So you went back to work at Crystal Tissue, Crystal where you'd been before. And uh, and Rick is 48. Rick's 48. And then uh, a year later, the, the Gary came along, which uh, 
He, I call him my accident, but uh, I love him just as much. Uh, <laughs> uh, his name is Garrett Dale. Garrett, uh, we call him Gary, Gary with two R's. Uh, and uh, Rick, he's Chester Richard Robinson II. Right. And then you had a third child. Amy. And Amy. Amy Lynn. Amy Lynn, and what's her last name now? Calic. And she's 42? She's 42. All right. Uh, uh, she, she's the baby, and, and that, she'll always be my baby. And after you uh, got out of the military and went back to Crystal Tissue, you stayed there for the rest of your working career, I, did I you? I stayed there for 36 years uh, until they shut the, you know, they went out of business. Uh, they shut down, and uh, they, they went down for a Christmas shutdown, and, and word came around that, I was working in a powerhouse at that time. Uh, my boss came around and he said, we're not gonna start back up, but said we'd like for people in the powerhouse to stay around and for about six months. And I had first found out that uh, my wife uh, had developed Parkinson's at that time. I said, Richard, I can't, uh, I can't do that. I gotta go find a job. And luckily enough, I had a friend that uh, had worked there at Crystal and he, he left a couple of years before that, but it was uh, unrelated to what was going on. And he told me that there may be a job coming open where he's working at. Where was that? That was down at Occidental Chemical in Cincinnati. And as luck would have had it, uh, at the beginning of, beginning of the year, somewhere around February or so, I went down and uh, put in an application, went and sat for an interview, and uh, I got the job. Uh, it was. Uh, a furnace operator's position. I, it, I'd never run a furnace other than a coal-fired furnace at, at Crystal Tissue for, for developing steam because uh, we ran turbines off of that steam pressure. Uh, the furnace didn't, uh, didn't need that much pressure. They needed temperature because uh, we were melting sand and soda ash to make glass, which was a different experience for me. It's just that I related that, that heat and that temperature to my Vietnam tales. I mean, uh, going into that place at 140 degrees. Oh, wow. It, it's just like walking into the, the jungle at, at whatever it wanted to be. Uh, it, it's just that the, uh, there was only two people working in there, me and, and the, uh, the guy that I was going to supply with the, uh, the glass. So how long did you work at Occidental? Almost 15 years. I, uh, I retired last spring. Uh, as, as of May the 1st, I was retired. Uh, is your wife still with you? She, she is. She's, uh, she, she's not doing real well. So her her uh, coordination is not good. I, I tried to get her to come up here today. Uh, but she said, no, her, her knees, her joints were not doing real well. And, uh, Do any of the kids live around? All my kids are, are pretty local. Uh, Two of them are out in Madison, Madison Township. The uh, Amy lives over in Trenton. Uh, like I said, uh, my uh, I have several cousins still around, but no uh, no aunts or uncles. Uh, right. It's just 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 us. Well, we're we're close to out of time. I want to thank you for, well, for doing this interview, and I want to thank you for your service. Well, like I said, I've got issues with that, but we'll cover them another time, maybe. Uh, everybody don't need my issues. Uh, everybody's got their own, how do you say, cross to bear. This is mine. Well, you, you did a great job today, and you did a great job uh, over Vietnam for us. Thank you so much. Well, like I said, it, it was my duty. When I went in, I'm probably not on, uh, on the tape, but when I was growing up, it was our duty to be a patriot. And when I went into the service, I volunteered for the draft. I wasn't drafted. I went in, I knew I was gonna have two years of service, and I made the best out of it. Uh, I come that close to, to being a, a, an, an enlistee uh, but I didn't know if I could get their physical through because I'd already been wounded. Uh, it was a, it was an experience, and it was an experience that uh, 
I wouldn't tell anybody not not pick it up. I mean, go for it. 